think this is a good time to start everything. So my name is Marshall Kozloff. I am Lincoln's Director of Outreach and Media. And seeing as we're sort of locked at home right now, the best outreach and media we can do is put together another Zoom call for you guys to listen to. So um, I hope we can make it like really interesting and entertaining. Um, we're actually gonna start doing a lot of these sort of moving forward. There's a lot of like real interest in these sort of conversations. Um, we are planning on doing a live stream that was all about sort of institutional reform, but then Mark Andreessen's essay came out um, sort of a week later. So I think it, that really sort of resonated with a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. So we have brought together a group of folks who I think are doing really interesting work in this sort of space um, that relates both to reform, building new institutions. So before I let them introduce themselves, um, just quick rundown. We've got Eli Dorado, who's a senior research fellow at the Center for Growth and Opportunity. Mark Lutter, who's the founder and executive director of the Charter Cities Institute. And Marcy Harris, finally, who's the CEO and co-founder of Pockbox. So just to start everything off, um, this can be a pretty loose conversation. How about um, just starting with Eli, you guys just sort of go into like what it is that you do really quickly and why you're broadly interested in the topic of reform and institution building. Great, thanks Marshall. So uh, I am Eli Dorado. I am a senior research fellow at the Center for Growth and Opportunity, like you said. And uh, basically I work on, I'm a trained as an economist and I work on economic growth and, and thinking about uh, specifically what kinds of technologies um, we need and, and how we can uh, accelerate the, the advent of those technologies to uh, you know, really move the needle on, on economic growth. And um, you know, I've, as I've been thinking about uh, this pandemic, you know, I've I've really come at it uh, from the perspective of an economist. I think that there is a um, sort of there's a sort of a naive uh, decision making model that we're all taught as economists, and that's like if you have um, certain facts and you have like a utility function, like you put those together and out pops a decision. Um, and you know, that's that's extremely naive. Um, and it's and it's not it's not wrong. It's just it's very condensed. And and each of those two things, the the, the facts, knowledge about the facts, and the the values or, or conflicts and values leads to two kinds of government failures. So you have knowledge problems uh, of the kind that Friedrich Hayek talked about, and you have uh, you know values misalignments of the kind that's that's very strong in the public choice literature. And those are two very strong like libertarian critiques of government which is that um, the government doesn't have the knowledge or the, um, or the incentive compatibility to uh, come up with, with uh, the, right, the right answer. And what's interesting about a pandemic is I think it shows, shines a light on the, the fuller decision-making process, right? That from, from the facts on the ground, those facts need to be interpreted through the brains of a policymaker, of a decision maker uh, it's got to happen between their ears, like with neurons firing, they have to have a mental model and come up with an in interpretation. And then, you know, that interpretation, you combine it with the values, but the, the decision making isn't automatic. It isn't, um, it's not as quick as just like solving a calculus problem, like, you know, I would give to my intermediate micro students. It's, um, it, it takes time. Um, and, and it, you know, the action doesn't pop out immediately. So, uh, so I've been thinking about, you know, sort of expanding from sort of the, the knowledge problem and, and, and public choice issues that we've, you know, especially those of us who are uh, relatively libertarian, uh, think have thought about traditionally and think about, well, how, how do we increase the quality of the, uh, the mental models that are being used to interpret this data uh, that policymakers are using? Um, and then how do you, how do you uh, build the institution that, that translates that into a decision uh, quickly that uh, is decisive, that, that takes action quickly? So, so that's like, how I'm thinking about, uh, you know, improving uh, decision making and improving our institutions in the pandemic. Great, Mark. You, uh, have, the so, edgiest, you have the edgiest background. I just had to yeah, start with that. I, <laughs> I hope that means something. Uh, well, right before this call, I felt guilty that I was uh, one of the few people without a cool background. So I went and downloaded this. Um, and I mean, the reference point, my, um, so my, I run the Charter Cities Institute. And what we're trying to do is basically build help build new cities. Uh, and so a charter city is a new city with a special jurisdiction that allows it to adopt a more competitive business environment. And we're primarily focusing uh, in emerging markets. Uh, so we're working with two projects right now, one in Zambia, a new city of 100,000 people called Umkwashi. Uh, the first people are moving in this year. It's being built outside of Lusaka, the capital of, of Zambia. 
then working with another uh, new city development in Nigeria called the Nyimba Economic City. They've acquired about 95 square kilometers. Their target population is 1.5 million residents. And we help draft their internal regulations, which would be in front of the Nigerian Export Processing Zone Authority if there were not a global pandemic. Um, and so what I think this has sort of forced us to do is to think really deeply about what does it actually mean to build institutions, right? What we're asking for is effectively a blank slate in law. So, right, not sovereignty, the criminal law the same, constitution the same, international treaties the same, but things like labor law, um, uh, environmental law, education, business registration, land registry, et cetera, all of these things are being built from scratch. So uh, what does that actually mean? One of my favorite examples of I don't know, effective responsiveness in a pandemic is actually not from this pandemic, but um, Ebola, where there was a Firestone plantation in Liberia uh, in 2015, I think. It had about 80,000 people. Um, and they're right, like, Ebola is very bad. And so what they did, they had no public health experts, but they just Googled, like, how do you stop Ebola? And uh, what they managed to do was, okay, if right, quarantine people when they come in, and if people come in and are sick, then make sure you uh, use protective gear to treat them. And because Ebola uh, has a sort of shorter, isn't asymptomatic as long and, 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 and has a higher mortality rate, but is a little bit less contagious. And so they did that. And in the middle of a raging Ebola epidemic in a country that is very poor, that was what, like 10, 15 years removed from a civil war, they managed in a, a uh, basically a small city of 80,000 people had zero, zero Ebola deaths. And so the way I think about it is, right, um, we often talk about technology, uh, how to sort of, right, like how can the iPhone make your life better? Um, but I think what we've uh, sort of lost is what might be described as social technology, right? Like how can we organize effectively to achieve desired outcomes? And this is one of the things I liked about uh, Mark Anderson's essay is, right, Silicon Valley has been building a lot in the world of, of atoms, but now there's finally this, uh, I think, growing interest in the, the world of, um, or they've built in the world of the bits. Now there's this growing interest in the world of atoms as well as in the world of, I don't know what to call it, people, um, in terms of how do we actually create these uh, institutions that are able to respond effectively, part of which might be deregulation. So allow uh, test makers to produce the tests without getting FDA approval, which could be slow. And then part of it is effective government action, like can government um, offer price guarantees for uh, factories that are repurposing their themselves to produce PPE, uh, because otherwise the factories might not want to take that sort of right, like investment that um, um, to, to repurpose themselves. Great, Marcy. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. I, I love uh, the opportunity to build on Eli and Mark's comments because uh, uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with the opportunity for, for data-driven policy. And, and I think that uh, we're in an interesting moment right now where the entire world is looking at the same chart to determine what policy decisions we're going to make. So I think we might be looking at a watershed, at least in the public appreciation of the concept of uh, data-driven policy making. Uh, so I'm Marcy Harris. I am a former congressional staffer and lawyer and founder of a tech company called Popbox. I've been in Silicon Valley for about 10 years, but keep a foot in D.C. Uh, pretty frequently and work very closely with Congress. Mark, uh, I, I uh, am, am jealous of the concept of starting with a clean slate. We don't get a charter Congress. So I, I think uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the way that uh, that we at Popbox and, and our colleagues in civil society have been thinking about this pandemic is how to help an institution that is, is certainly not a clean slate that starts with many traditions and, and constraints um, update itself and, and be ready to respond to a pandemic, but also just in general, the challenges of the 21st century, which I think we may look back at this time and say the 21st century actually started uh, during this time as, uh, as we are looking at infrastructure that may have in some cases been digital, but it wasn't uh, 21st century uh, infrastructure. It was in, in many cases taking an analog system and just turning it into bits. And I think now is the time to think about how you would design a system, and this is kind of to the Charter City's point, how you would decide a, a system and institutions with the technical capabilities that exist today. And, and I think this pandemic illustrates why that's so important. Um, and I think of infrastructure, 
I think we all do here, not as, as a full stack phenomenon. So it's not just, if you're thinking about, you know, analog analogs, it's not just uh, railroad tracks, it's uh, railroad companies and laws and customs and traditions. And in a lot of ways, yes, we've laid the fiber uh, to have a, uh, well, not sufficiently, but, but um, for the most part to bring half the world online. Uh, but we haven't designed the institutions uh, that that uh, need to be in place to adjust to this new kind of world. Uh, my first public service experience was in disaster recovery, so I am kind of predisposed to see a disaster, even a slow moving one like COVID as a catalyst for building. Uh, I the um, Andreessen's uh, essay resonated greatly with me, although part of me was just like, yeah, that's what we've been saying for a while. Uh, but it's great to hear that message coming from many different places. Uh, I, my, um, the, my first disaster experience was, was when my town got hit by a tornado. And uh, thinking about the way you respond to a disaster, there's kind of the immediate health and safety concern. And then you get into this limbo state when things are not normal and well and and you kind of start to realize that they're not going to be normal uh but I, I kind of refer to it as the blue tarp stage so it's when you're you're dealing with um a, a suboptimal reality and trying to plan for what comes next and i think we are entering that now and will be here for many months and uh for me that has meant a lot of working to figure out how congress can continue to do its work as it begins to plan for what comes next. Um, I wanna give a shout out to Adam Thier, who I saw is on the call because his writing introduced me to this concept of the pacing problem. Uh, and uh, working with some colleagues in the American Political Science Association to make recommendations to the uh, House Select Committee on Modernization this past year, we drew heavily on that concept of the pacing problem that, that, the, that technology develops exponentially and policy at best uh, develops linearly. And so the gap uh, exacerbates over time. And we, we actually said that Congress itself has three pacing problems. There's the external pacing problem that everybody knows about, which is its inability to keep up and understand and, and adjust to the changing society. Then there's two others. There's the interbranch pacing problem, which is that it gives resources and mandates to the executive branch to better use data and technology, but doesn't give the same to itself. Uh, so the gap between the executive branch and the legislative branch continues. And then the internal pacing problem, because Congress doesn't give itself the, it, the tools that it needs to operate uh, in a modern way. And, and that kind of comes full circle back to the question of data-driven policymaking and legislation because if Congress can't uh, have a modern system for doing its mail, it's certainly not gonna be able to handle real-time data about how programs are being carried out for its, its conduct of oversight and refinement of policy. So I just throw that out there because I actually think that we are at a moment where some of the conversations that we thought that were going to be very long-term conversations about new kinds of infrastructure may take place very quickly over the next few months, just out of absolute need. And as I said, a new appreciation for the role of data in our lives. Uh, and, I, and I think that we're going to see some readjustment of the long-term roadmap for institution building and a new receptiveness uh, to hear solutions that, that might have been a little harder to, to discuss in the past. Um, when the status quo is not an option, uh, which is where we find ourselves now, there's a, there's a real opportunity for uh, different ways of doing things and even for some strange bedfellow alliances. I, I think what we're seeing among policymakers, at least in Congress, in, in an optimistic case is less, less of a left-right division and more of a generational division. And I think there is an opportunity to, um, to address that in a way that, um, that folks see benefit for whatever their particular ideology happens to be. So I look forward to this conversation and digging in with you guys. Yeah, so um, after this question, we'll sort of just throw it um, to the group and hope we can just have a conversation and everything. Um, but it's a pretty basic question, like what should we be building? Um, because I think, uh, and, the, and sort of a related point about like how exactly did we get here and how does that story connect to what we're trying to build, right? Because I think it's possible to say that, you know, actually, you know, Congress 
is Congress. Um, and when you put problems in front of it, you could spend money. Um, we're talking, you know, in Mark's essay, he's talking about how cities can't construct housing that quickly, but I think you could take a bigger step back and say with COVID-19, the issue is that we tied our economy too tight to the Chinese. We um, relied on institutions like the World Health Organization. We should decouple ourselves further from those. So where do we sort of see the connection between the sort of like structural things that the sort of crisis has revealed and the sort of decisions about what exactly we should be building after that? And I'll just throw that to the group. Oh, I'll jump in first. So, um, I think the way I would, uh, I think that's a good sort of framing. And the way I would answer it is in economics, because I'm also trained as an economist, uh, competition matters. And basically the U.S. hasn't had a competitor for at least 30 years. And even when the Soviet Union was a competitor at its peak, its industrial capacity was uh, less than 50% um, ours. So it was never really a, a, a competitor in, in terms of the total uh, sort of industrial output. And I think what happened was basically the lack of a competitor, as well as there's probably a degree of truth in uh, Tyler Cowen's thesis, uh, The Great Stagnation, that we picked all of the low hanging fruit for technological innovation. And what happened then, and I, I would add to that, I think this, this massive um, demographic bulge with the baby boomers, so you basically had this combination of three factors. One, no uh, competitor to put any stress on our institutions. Two, this very large uh, demographic boom that basically because of the social networks, there was a very interesting graph that was passed around a few months ago. The average, over the last 14 years, the average age of a CEO has gone up 14 years. Um, and so this demographic boom basically, like not, there's no sort of, intent there, but institutionally basically used uh, this wave to enrich themselves and add that to uh, the fact that there wasn't any of this broader technological innovation. So while in an era, uh, maybe the late 19th century, where there was a lot of innovation, this, this, these trends could have been sustained. Uh, the lack of innovation sort of caused uh, everything to basically, I don't know, decay on, on, on certain margins. And I think then the, the sort of what, what COVID has exposed is that the, the, the sort of rot is much deeper than um, we had anticipated. I've been pretty skeptical about American institutions for a while, uh, but I'm still continuously surprised by the uh, slow response. And I'm not uh, particularly optimistic on uh, the future, uh, just because if you if we look, there's still a lot of partisanship, right? Typically, an external threat will cause people to come together, but apparently, a disease that literally blocks down the entire country isn't a sufficient external threat to um, come together. And so, yeah, I mean, there is some of this, um, I think, mistake in how we've dealt with China, in that we have been the global hegemon and expected, okay, we'll help China get rich, and in exchange, they'll join our global order. And that is uh, clearly not the case. And I think our politicians are realizing that. But I think the broader issue of this uh, basically lack of competition that has led to institutional complacency um, combined with this demographic uh, sort of uh, boom with the baby boomers has created a, a perfect storm for uh, sclerosis and uh, lack of sort of vision and um, meaningful desire to change. And I think what hopefully Mark Andreessen's essay can help revitalize is this demand to build. And Silicon Valley, even though they focused in the world of atoms, is really one of the only places in the country that still has this uh, broader vision. And so, for example, um, most of the, the tech companies sent people home to work earlier because they are the only sort of entrepreneurs left where a lot of other life, uh, particularly in the Acela quarter, I believe, has basically been sanitized, where you have your specialty, this is what I'm an expert in, but you basically defer any decision outside that very specific set of expertise. Well, if you're actually building a company, no, you need to make decisions on this wide variety of things. And so the skin in the game has led to a, a skill set that has broadly uh, died out amongst our current uh, political elite, which I think is, is sort of tied to that general um, institutional sclerosis, which explains the, the poor response that, that we're seeing today. So to the, to the question of what we build, I actually 
I, I do think that there is something to learn from Silicon Valley when it comes to answering that question, which is to start with a definition of what problem you're trying to solve and work backwards. And that, that is at a, at a meta level, I think, uh, and this is kind of where I, I go back to wanting to see more evidence and data and policy. Uh, but I think to, uh, to kind of talk about a process that would uh, begin with a clear definition of what we're trying to achieve and then allow a tremendous amount of freedom in getting there uh, and the ability to compare approaches and refine along the way and, um, and you know, allow for adjustment based on what the data is showing is, it, to me, that, that is the kind of approach that begins to take the ideology out of the picture. An ability to agree upon some, some goals and attach some metrics to them and allow for uh, a thousand flowers to bloom in the implementation. Uh, and and for, so for me, I think the, there's a process question around how we're going to measure success that then begins to tell us what kinds of institutions we should build to be able to handle a process like that. To follow up on that though, um, sorry Eli, um, can we, I, I think if we're thinking about how do we sort of, because uh, Mark, to refer to something that you wrote, you wrote um, a follow-up essay um, um, that we should link um, about how we should be building movements um, to actually accomplish these building objectives. I'm, Marcy, I'm not sure that we can separate ideology from things, right? Because we, we can have the data and we can sort of look at that from a technocratic perspective, but I, I'm curious how you think ideology is going to define how people interpret that data, how, where it takes people to lead that data. Um, so I'm not sure how you, so for example, you could take a look at the data and say, okay, the conclusion is, is that America um, was so vulnerable, like once again, because of this China issue, or you could say it was vulnerable because government got too big in the first place. And we shouldn't even have an FDA in the first place, which is something libertarians would cheer about, but that's some, or you could be a progressive and say the lesson from this crisis is we don't have universal health care. We should have our own version of the national health service. So how do we sort of navigate ideology and data? Well, I, I, I would, I think you have to bring it down to a much more micro level when you're looking mm -hmm. at uh, implementation. So less uh, trying to compare large scale approaches and more kind of micro implementation. So I think less to, to the examples you were giving and, and more to, you know, right now, like it or not, we're about to have a lot of AB testing happening in the approach to uh, reopening. And there are lots of different ways that ideology is going to impact the decisions made by potentially local leaders on the ground. Uh, but ultimately, the, the data that you compare uh, as you look across countries or states or cities, et cetera, is, is going to tell us a lot about what the impact was of the various approaches. And ideally, we wouldn't be waiting, and this is where I, I fault our current mm -hmm. policy process, we wouldn't be waiting two years for a GAO report to tell us how that worked. We'd be able to look at the data in more real time and even adjust based on what we're learning. So Marshall, uh, to go back to your other question about, about what should we build, um, I think that, that the number one thing is we need to get, we need better people. Um, like people, I, I, I mean, specifically in, 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 in government and in the media, um, if you look at the beginning of this crisis and, and how quick people were to react to it, I think there were there were so many uh, there were there were different kinds of failures, right? One one kind of failure was like people were too literally too dumb to understand that like a small number of cases growing exponentially could be really really bad, uh, you know, down the down the line. I think that there was another kind of failure, which is like okay, I understand that, but like the experts say, you know, it's it's not a problem. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, and so like too deferential to expertise uh, as as you know thinking like. Well, I don't have to think for myself. I can just like sort of defer to the expert and we don't need any sort of like generalists to like sort of like navigate the conflicting uh, reports from experts. Um, and then I think there was also, you know, a whole class of people that we saw, um, you know, on Twitter and stuff that was like right by accident. Like there's a lot of people who, who you know, have predicted, you know, 20 of the last one pandemics um, and, and just sort of like, you know, enjoy like LARPing prepper. Um, so, so there's like, we can't just like take everyone who was right about the pandemic and like put them in office. So it's, it's actually like a, a really hard problem of how do you get better people um, in, in certainly in electoral politics. And I think for that, you know, you have to look at electoral reform, thinking about um, ways to, uh, to, make, to make the system uh, elect more 
uh, moderate competent people, right? So the, the median voter theorem would say that both party candidates from both parties believe the same thing and the voters just deciding on which which one is would they prefer and that should be the more competent one. But in fact, the, the, the party primary system um, results in uh, in, in a, a party base choosing someone that's not doesn't have the median voter belief, right? And 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 that means that you're, you're divorcing uh, the the person who's elected from the the median position. So um, so election rules that uh, incentivize like moderation and broad appeal, um, like approval voting or Congress Day methods, like that would uh, that would reduce um, sort of like owning the libs as a uh, as a viable campaign platform. Um, and, and that would uh, uh, improve, uh, I think, the, the caliber of people in office that are able to like process the, the data as it comes along. Um, and then also like thinking about like the civil service, right? Like we, we need a better civil service. How do we get better people there? Uh, you know, part of it is, is paying more, um, but I wouldn't want to pay more without other more fundamental cultural um, reforms to, uh, to, to, to improve the, the quality of people that are attracted to that life, right? And so the thing we should think about things like bringing back the civil service exam, um, making it possible to fire underperforming civil servants. Um, and that's just on the, that's just on the people side. And I think, you know, on the, on the um, government process side, we need to value speed and, and speedy decision making and, and coming up with an answer quicker. A lot of, a lot of our processes, um, value getting the right answer more than getting an answer quickly uh, and fixing it later. Um, so, so maybe we need to recognize we don't need all these checks and balances. We would, it would be better to get a, a somewhat correct answer quicker and we'll fix it on the other side, uh, you know, when, when, uh, when errors uh, are made. So I think, I think, you know, better people and, and, and building in a culture of speed in government processes, I think are the two, two things we should be focusing on. I, I think that something, and I'm taking this from your comment, Eli, um, there's a whole category of people, right, who have been right about um, the pandemic, sort of in terms of the, the effects. Like you said, there are a lot of people in that category who predicted one for the past 20 years, so the hit rate isn't that great. So that should affect whether or not you sort of, how much you value their expertise going forward. But I think a question would be, what shouldn't we be building? Because I think the problem here is that a lot of folks, myself included, um, will sort of take this sort of moment of like, we need to build institutions, but rather than, and this is to your point about data too, Marcy, but rather than sort of um, make their assessment what we need to build based on data, they're going to make that assessment based on pre-existing opinions that they held. So I'm not saying the progressive left is inherently wrong, but I just know people who say like, this shows we need universal healthcare. Um, and it's not quite clear that, you know, this does necessarily. So what shouldn't we, so what do you guys think we should be, should not be building um, in this moment? Um, if there's anything that clearly is there. I would say silos. So uh, what, to me, a, a modernized government, whether in the executive branch or the legislative branch, is going to require the ag department talking to the housing department, talking to the educational department, talking, you know, they, they, we're going to need as we're looking at data to try to make these decisions about what works and how we're going to do it and, and things like that, the the most important thing is that we're breaking down silos, not building them. So if I, if I could just make one pitch, it's that we don't need any more siloed organizations that are addressing narrow problems because right now in this century, the ability to learn from, you know, we need to be generalists as people uh, and, and to learn from lots of different fields. And the same is true in government. The, the lessons that we draw from, from you know, this, this part of the economy versus this part of the economy, it needs to be a more holistic view uh, so that we can draw conclusions across uh, the sectors. Yeah, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so I mean, this doesn't really answer your question, but I think uh, there have been a lot of libertarians that focus on big government, big government is bad. And I think there's an important distinction between big government and effective government. Um, and I think this is also a challenge with, with progressives, right? Like the problem wasn't like FDA funding per se. The problem was that the FDA had a specific view of its role that um, as well as obviously the legislation that empowers the FDA, that was bad. Um, the FDA could have, for example, when, uh, 
I forget her name, Dr. Chu in Seattle called them and said, we have a positive test. They could have said, oh no, this is awful. Like, please test as many of the samples as you can instead of saying like what you did was illegal, uh, stop it. Um, and this obviously has come up again and again and again, uh, not just in terms of the FDA, they're a sort of easy target, but in terms of uh, the CDC, in terms of seeing the federal government go around and buy PPE out of the hands of states. And so just, um, I think seeing, right, like it's important to empower government, but it's important to empower government in the right way with the right uh, framework. And to me, this, um, I guess I'll disagree a little bit with Marcy here. This isn't necessarily a question of uh, data. I think the data would help, but I think it's a little bit more, um, I guess fundamental and you might maybe, maybe it's called ideology maybe it's not I'm, I'm not exactly sure but it is sort of this mindset like eli said of moving faster um tyler cowan and patrick hollison launched fast grants which has given i think twice as many grants to covid researchers as the nih has right um so how do we get things to move quicker do we need to do a a, a study maybe we can design rct to see what the outcomes of us moving quicker or slower maybe but like i think we should uh, try to move quicker. And I, I think this requires this, I think this is part of the challenge, this broad reconceptualization of what is the role of government. Um, and if we look back at uh, American history, there's sort of two examples that I think we can draw from that offer a little bit of insight. One is the progressive era in the sort of late 19th, early 20th century. And what did they do? They realized that a lot of government was basically crony, uh, cronyism, where every time there'd be a change in the governor, for example, uh, all of the bureaucrats would change. And so this was a way to sort of professionalize government. And it did have some other things in terms of much more government intervention in the economy, um, but, but it really changed the nature of how we understood government in the US. The second uh, example, which may, might be more apt is uh, environmentalism, uh, which sort of, at least the modern environmental movement sprung from uh, Parsons book uh, about malaria that really realized, okay, the environment is important. Like this needs to be broad ranging on a lot of different aspects of government to help for, uh, uh, protect the environment. And so I think if we think about, right, like the broad goal as more economic growth, as progress defined as, right, like steady uh, innovations, inventions that lead to lives that are better off for people, um, then I think that is sort of an ideology that can be analogized to environmentalism or it has to infect all of these different parts of the government. And it has things to say about a lot of them. It doesn't necessarily have anything to say about welfare reform um, or welfare generally, right? Like, but it has to say with, okay, we should, uh, right, like maybe lower the average age of NIH grants. Um, maybe we should uh, right, like invest more in basic R&D. We should remove some of the barriers uh, to uh, uh, drug and medical device innovation. And, and trying to get this, I guess, cultural change really baked in onto multiple layers of government, uh, which I think is, is uh, challenging because it effectively requires a replacement of um, most of the administrative class, or at least a change in the ideology of much of the um, administrative class, uh, which is not easy. And, and so this is why I've sort of been, I guess, harping on the point that I think Silicon Valley needs to become more, more political. And, and one of my friends likes to joke, uh, Silicon Valley typically thinks politics is below them, but in fact, they're below politics. And we see that with the fact that they're unable to build housing in their own backyard. Um, Apple, for example, pledged $2.5 billion to affordable housing, uh, right? And so they find it easier to just give away $2.5 billion to uh, build housing instead of hiring a few lobbyists uh, to actually change the, the law in, in San Francisco and Cupertino and, and the surrounding um, uh, region. So I think there needs to be some of this vision as well as some of this um, uh, political will. And so I think, uh, I mean, I don't know how many uh, folks in SF are sort of listening on the call, um, but when I applied to the Charter, uh, with the Charter Studies Institute to a prestigious um, accelerator, we mentioned that, hey, we're like literally drafting, helping to draft the laws for a new city that's going to have um, has a target population of 1.5 million residents. And their response was, oh, so you're consulting. And I didn't really have a snarky retort then, and, uh, but it's just, okay, like if you view like writing the laws for a new city as being consulting, then perhaps of course you don't understand how to change the laws in your own city. Um, but having that, that I think change in mindset that um, 
values builders, not just of technology companies, but also of what might be called sort of new institutions or just changing existing institutions, I think needs to be affected at a cultural level in Silicon Valley before they can really, um, I, I, I think, project that, that, that mindset um, across the rest of the country to focus on on um, building institutions that are more effective and more responsive and allow for a, a more dynamic and healthy society. Yeah, and just to reference your essay before we go to Eli real quick, um, you, you had this line where you said, um, build movements, don't necessarily build another app. Um, and I think that that's sort of a, a, that's actually a huge sort of mental shift that you're gonna have to sort of make from sort of like the past, what, you know, pre-COVID era. But yeah, so Eli, please. Yeah, so I think it's, it's really interesting to think about um, the response in the U.S. versus South Korea, right? We had, I think, our, our first uh, first cases, you know, basically at the same time, and uh, and 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 South Korea responded very forcefully and now has it under control, and and the United States uh, did not, right? And um, and and so you know, it shows it, it it isn't a question of data, right? We all had the same data. Everyone in the world saw what was happening. Um, it threw through an immense fog of war, but we all had the same sort of sort of v set of, of of data points that that uh, that everyone else had, and countries responded differently. And so I think that shows it's 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 not about data; it's actually about interpretations of data and about um, being able to react quickly. Um, I, you know, so so if we can't, um, if our policymakers are are just are not as um, are not as responsive because they either because they don't understand or because they don't have um, the infrastructure in place to be able to make decisions quickly. Like that's what we need to focus on. Um, and and uh, so so I, you know it, it is um, it's not an easy it's not an easy fix. There's not like a couple things we can we can tweak um, that um, that will magically make everything better. But there, there's there's you know steps we can take that will um, gradually lead to improvement, but I, but it's not. We're not going to get the kind of institutions that we want um, through you know um, relatively minor reforms. Right. Um, so we'll, we'll pivot to um, questions now. Um, can you guys um, see the questions? We could start with Sean's question. Um, and basically, this is for everyone. Um, should empowering He's referencing um, doctors in Bakersfield that were censored. Should empowering local innovation be the focus of changing the way we do government? For example, allowing the people of Bakersfield the choice of trusting doctors in their town, right? So the way I sort of interpret this is how granular are the reforms we're looking at? Is, is this at the local level? Is it at the national level? Or is this at the state level? How do you guys think about that? Yeah, I'm not super familiar with this. I, I do think that, um, and, and nor would I wade into a, a medical question, uh, but I, I I do think that the the larger question about innovation is certainly that it should be empowered powered at all levels. And again, that that's that's why I endorse a model of of setting high level metrics and goals and allowing for lots of different approaches to implementation and a standardized way to compare. Uh, results uh, in as near as real time as possible and refinement along the way. Uh, but that that model allows for innovation at, at all levels. Great. So we could go to Christian's uh, question. Um, basically, um, they're sort of built into this, but I think the core question is, are there concrete examples of novel coordination mechanisms that we've seen emerge since the COVID crisis? Um, so this could be individuals, businesses, cities, states, anything sort of like that. Um, feel free to take that all, everyone. I think that one, one thing that really interested me was um, the sort of the, the health weather data set. Have you seen this from uh, the, the company called Kinsa that has a smart thermometer product? And they were basically aggregating it, aggregating the data and, and sort of like prevent, presenting a map of the U.S. with like observed trend and uh, anomalous uh, levels of of feverish illness, um, and I think in the early days of the um, of the pandemic, when we, there wasn't any testing and uh, we you know, we didn't really know what was going on, I you know it, maybe it didn't turn out to be as useful as, as it could have been. But um, but it, but I thought it was really I thought it was really an interesting um, potential model for thinking about the way uh, a decentralized set of um, of medical devices could could be used to sort of give give policymakers sort of like real time data on on what what's actually going on, 
and I thought, you know, especially about, you know, um, Apple watches. So, so the, every, every Apple watch that's ever been made has a uh, pulse oximeter in it. Um, that's never been enabled by, by Apple, you know, presumably for, for FDA type reasons. Um, and, and, you know, pulse oximetry is really important in, in uh, treating COVID because uh, you know, one, of the, one of the problems is you don't get enough oxygen in, in your blood. So, so I, th I think thought a lot about, you know, wearable computers and, um, and, and sensors and uh, what biology uh, Srinivasan calls um, uh, diagnostic grade wearables and, and thinking about, you know, what, <laughs> what that looks like scaled up uh, if we had, uh, you know, Mark was talking about FDA uh, device reform. If you had that, you know, could could we have, you know, much much richer data sets, real time uh, data sets of of what's happening, um, you know, in terms of of, of health uh, at both individual and and regional levels. And if I could just add on to that, I think this, those are such great examples, Eli. And and I, I even think of like every Tesla that has an air quality filter on it. There are so many examples of things that if the government wanted to build it, it would cost a gazillion dollars and the data would, would not be as good. And so for a company like Kinza or Tesla or others to, to provide information in a depersonalized way, uh, that can help inform policymakers is, I mean, I think we're just at the very beginning of what that looks like and figuring out what the institution is on the inside that receives that data and that uh, puts it in, in a format that can easily be uh, uh, obser observed by the policymakers and, and make its way into policy is, I think that's part of the institutional challenge that we're talking about. So, so it's LJ's question. Um, we've all mentioned we need to change our institutions and build new ones. So how do we actually go about um, creating that change? And actually, I'd like to start with you, Mark, because you actually wrote an essay um, on this. I keep referencing your stuff. I really liked it. Um, oh, but uh, please. Um, yeah, so I think, right, like I'm based in D.C. I grew up in D.C. I come from a distinguished line of bureaucrats. Um, but I tend to think that most of the institutional change, or at least the, the sort of framework for that could come from Silicon Valley, basically. They have a different way of looking at risk uh, because, right, like sort of the venture capital model, invest in 10 companies, one pays off the rest. Um, they have a different way of looking at entrepreneurship. The high net worth individuals in Silicon Valley tend to be a lot weirder than the high net worth individuals in New York because in New York, right, you have to sort of cut your teeth in an investment bank and they beat all the individuality and creativity out of you. While in Silicon Valley, you might found your first uh, company when you're, I don't know, 25, and you still have a degree of that um, original personality. But to, I think, get a little bit more specific, um, I think what this looks like is basically doing what the Lincoln Network is doing, continuing to build these um, bridges. Uh, as well as, for example, I, I sort of was uh, DMing somebody on Twitter, right, in response to Andreessen's essay, there could be an Andreessen Fellowship, where he basically takes, I don't know, five to ten um, promising people in the DC policy space, flies them out to SF for a week, goes and introduces them to a bunch of influential people, and, right, like, that then raises the status of the DC policy people um, in DC, as well as in SF and forces SF to get a little bit more granular about um, the reforms. Uh, one of our donors, for example, has his own internal think tank, doesn't really give to outside think tanks. And I think why he does this is because there's this, uh, what might be called, I don't know, suspicion in uh, San Francisco with nonprofits, where it's just kind of like, you're part of the paper quarter, um, the Acela quarter, but it's like you're, you're just sort of taking money, eating rents, but you're not actually producing anything of value. And there's definitely a degree of truth to that. At the same time, there is still um, value produced by some of these institutions. And the fact that there's so little trust that you decide to right, create your own when you could just fund another one that would put out very, very similar uh, content suggests that there is still this uh, dialogue that needs to take place. There's a uh, constant suspicion in San Francisco of nonprofits, right? Like, why don't you just start a company and make money? A nonprofit isn't uh, sustainable. And so given that, I think, right, like most of these ideals about these institutional reforms about building things come from San Francisco, right? It's no surprise that Mark Anderson wrote the essay and not somebody in DC or somebody in New York. Uh, I think, right, getting more granular and actually starting to build some of these, um, like what is the Y Combinator for institution builders? It might not be, right, like it's not gonna be Y Combinator that works only because it, it takes for-profit for companies. But I have several uh, friends who are interested in creating their own sort of like 
I don't know what to call it, like nonprofits, think tank-ish things who have an interesting set of idea, uh, ideas, but are unwilling to take the leap because those funding streams don't exist. Um, because uh, in San Francisco, if you take a leap uh, and start your own startup and fail, you can typically go back to your previous job at Google or Facebook, even sometimes with higher pay. Well, in DC, if you go and try to start your own thing and you fail, then um, one, there's sort of this question of inherent skepticism in DC of like, oh, you can cut it at Brookings, so you need to start your own thing. And then two, if it doesn't work out and a lot of things, startups don't work out and you try to go back to your old thing, then they probably won't, won't, won't allow you to, 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 to sort of take up your old job, right? You have a lower, lower status as well as lower, um, um, monetary income and so I, I think this 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 sort of right like there needs to be a DC uh, more of a startup culture but I think there also needs to be to allow some of these newer ideas that are a little bit different from the um, existing discourse but I think that needs to be supported by San Francisco both in terms of right like uh, money in terms of status um, in terms of right like seeing uh, policy entrepreneurs as as builders. It's not the same as building a company, but it does have uh, similar dynamics. And um, I think, right, like if Silicon Valley really wants to get their ideas into practice, uh, that level of engagement is necessary because we're seeing what happens um, when they there isn't really that much engagement. Uh, and I guess to to conclude on this point, right, like I think success. Um, every presidential administration takes two or three bankers from New York and gives them cabinet or cabinet equivalent level positions. And so if we think about, right, like success of what might be called the builder movement, that looks like two or three people from Silicon Valley getting cabinet or cabinet level positions, right? Like why isn't Mark Andreessen Secretary of Commerce or something? Um, he could presumably do at least as good of, if not a better job than taking whoever is senior VP at Goldman Sachs in a given year. I'll just say a little bit, uh, I mean, institutions, I don't think are actually like a real thing, right? Like institutions are just all the things that we do. Um, it's all the laws, all the habits, you know, that we, that we, you know, culturally have. And, um, and so the way you build them is, you know, one law or one habit at a time, right? So it's, it's actually, um, there's no, um, there's no, uh, you know, silver bullet. If we just build this one thing, then we solved all our problems. It's it's much more of a, um, we need to we need to reflect on, you know, our, our values and and figure out how to get them sort of enacted across a wide uh, wide range of of issues and, um, and 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 structures, and and so so it's 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 you know it's a very very long term project and uh and and we all you know if if we're serious you know those of us who uh want to build uh, like mark Andreessen uh uh wrote um we need to not just like you know uh cheerlead it for like a week and then uh forget about it right it it needs to be a a constant uh refrain that we all um adopt and and, and continue to push forward for uh, for the next, you know, couple decades. Well, and, and I would just say, I, I think uh, the, the points that Andreessen makes are new out of his mouth. They're not new points to be made. So certainly they've been made before. What's unique is, is them coming from him and, and to your point, Mark, coming uh, from the Valley. And, and I would say, actually, you know, there, there's, there's like a generation every 10 years or so of, of oh, now Silicon Valley is really going to engage with DC. They've learned their lesson and the doors are open and they're speaking the same language again. And, and then there's kind of a recess that happens and then something bad happens and they all talk again. Uh, that, that flow needs to be a, a, a little bit better, uh, that, that road better paved. And I do really uh, give kudos to, to Lincoln Network for, for working to do that. I think that, that, that you've made a lot of progress, even in just holding conversations like this. Um, as far as institutions, I, I take your point, Eli, that, that institutions, you know, yes, they are constructed in law and, and sometimes involve buildings and things like that. But I think the, the kind of institutional reform or institutional evolution that we should be talking about now is really an, an evolution of a vision and an evolution of process. And it doesn't matter what building it goes into and, and ideally it doesn't go into any building. It, it lives uh, you know, in, in the flow back and forth between agencies, between the public and the government and, and businesses and, and government and 
and that there's a more open flow uh, uh, on how we set the priorities, how we implement, and how it's going. So uh, it's not just a set a policy and, and leave it. Uh, it is an, an ongoing to borrow a Silicon Valley term iterative process. And I think I think that's the kind of institution we should be looking for. Um, and, and just to finish up um, with Alexia's question, um, and just a pretty straightforward, how do you deal with this, the, the basic issue of just the fact we live in a super hyper partisan time. So any movement, that you're, any work you're trying to do, any sort of action you're going to take is just sort of run into that buzzsaw. And that's more of a DC problem than a San Francisco problem. Like, what are you guys' quick thoughts on that? Uh, I think it certainly makes it challenging, but I think there's a maybe a degree of optimism that I wouldn't have had a month ago. So, for example, um, uh, Ezra Klein uh, wrote a pretty positive response to Anderson's essay, where he also focused on building institutions and specifically institutional reform in the, the Senate and the House that could allow for um, more policies. Uh, the Democrats did successfully defeat um, the Sanders incumbency. Uh, and so there, I think, is, if framed in the right way, they can, these ideas can get traction with kind of the uh, mainstream left. And I think uh, they can also potentially get traction with the right. Uh, the right has this history of focusing on sort of reducing regulations, reducing barriers to immigration, as well as uh, uh, this, um, there's a little bit of a resurgence in the growth of like sort of physical infrastructure um, uh, that is coming to a certain extent from the nationalistic right. So um, I think it will definitely be challenging to, uh, to get there, but I think there's at least a potential for open dialogue that, that, that should be started and hopefully like this conversation and, and Mark's essay can help frame some of that dialogue. I think I'm much more pessimistic about uh, sort of the partisan environment. Um, you know, I think there's basically, uh, there's basically two ways to, to make uh, uh, DC uh, less partisan or less di divided. Uh, and one of them uh, is like thoroughgoing electoral form and the other one is blowing up the internet. So we have to do like one or the other and or, or else uh, it's going to be uh, divisive for, for a long time. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm pretty fond of the internet, so I want to keep the internet. So I think that the only real solution is, uh, is, is electoral reform and sort of, uh, you know, having, having a, uh, an electoral uh, structure or a rule that, that incentivizes sort of like moderation and broad appeal is, is really the only way that you're going to sort of blunt the, the sort of like the partisan, um, uh, the partisan dynamic that, that exists in, in DC. So just to quickly, um, we have one last question that I'll expand to the group. Let's try to give like just a quick 30 second answer to this. Like what is, what are some specific ideas from Silicon Valley or DC? Um, that's my editorial thing I'll add that you guys are most excited about that everyone should take a look into after they leave this call. Uh, I mean, like the idea of progress, uh, perhaps it's not that new anymore. Uh, Mark Andre, or not Mark Andrews, and Patrick Collison and Tyler Cowan at the essay in the Atlantic last July, I think, uh, calling for a new science of, of progress. And um, right, this idea that we can uh, sort of change the world to make it better for ourselves. And right now, I. I I think what's 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 interesting about that is that much of the less rest of the country doesn't actually hold that belief anymore, <laughs> right? There, there just isn't an interest in actually building something. Uh, I sometimes feel somewhat alone, for example, in DC, because I see myself as building something and most people in DC don't uh, see themselves as building anything. And so there isn't this this ethos of right, like what, like what, what the actual process is, um, and so the fact that uh, right, like this is generally somewhat generic, and it's the topic of the whole conversation. It's, it's not that specific, but this idea that like we can actually make these changes, we can implement these reforms, we can have this um, um, positive impact on the world, and that it's starting to coalesce into a, a meaningful political vision that. Uh, we hopefully take steps towards implementing that uh, broader set of ideas uh, that can lead to uh, a better life. I mean, I have been half joking over the past month, like I don't want to live most of my adult life in a failed state, 
but um, that seems to be a non-trivial possibility at this point. And the hopes for um, uh, changing that, I think, come from this uh, set of ideas that we've been discussing over the call. I'm a little bit more optimistic. I mean, I, I, I actually do think that uh, the options of policy imagination have been blown up over the past um, month, two months. I think uh, we are facing an existential threat. It's taking a while for it to uh, kind of make its way into the, to the policy consciousness that uh, the, the scale of what we're dealing with economically and health-wise. I mean, I actually think that it is good preparation for the kinds of big questions that are coming in the decades ahead. Uh, I was telling someone today, coronavirus is the ultimate trolley problem. I mean, there are big decisions being made and a big conversation that has to be had. And this is not the first uh, issue that's going to come with those kinds of big questions. And so I, I am optimistic that uh, we're going to need new kinds of institutions and new ways of approaching things that don't neatly separate into partisan buckets uh, that uh, might just have us uh, thinking differently and speaking differently about uh, the things ahead. Well, great, Eli, do you have anything to add to that? Um... Uh, no, I'm, 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 the, I'm the doomsayer and Marcy <laughs> is, is the optimist. So that's, that's, uh, that, that's a, a, a reasonable disagreement. And, uh, you know, w unfortunately, you know, we'll, we, we have no choice but to find out and see what happens. <laughs> On that super optimistic note, thanks everyone for joining this. This has been really great. Uh, I think it's sort of a good mix between sort of pessimism and optimism and we'll hopefully find sort of a median uh, there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for attending, especially to the participants. The questions are really great. Um, and we're looking forward to doing this again uh, really soon. So thank you everyone.